Good evening, everyone. My name is Indira Chandrasekhar, and I'm the curator of literature at the Kalakura Arts Festival. This is the second in the series, Passion and Plurality, that is featured at the literature platform of the festival in collaboration with the Bangalore International Center. The first in the series was an examination of the impact of mass media on culture, pedagogy, and reason with Ranjit Hoskote and Preem Chandavarkar. And it left us thinking about ways to craft our future public interactions, our future public spheres. Today's session focuses on the intersection of culture and language and fascination with text and the passion for making, making it possible for this text to be accessed, archived, viewed, understood, celebrated, and indeed be a subtle expression of power. Thus, grounding our past and our present in the complex landscape of religion and culture. Here to share their scholarship with us, and I have to state that their bios are available on the web, so I'll only just mention the most recent of their many publications here. Here to share their scholarship with us, Audrey Trushke, whose latest publication is The Language of History, Sanskrit Narratives of Muslim Pasts, which brings to light texts from the late 12th century to the early to mid 18th century, written by, and I quote from the blurb on Amazon, Indian men and at least one woman, on Muslim-initiated political events. Supriya Gandhi, who is the emperor who never was, Darash Ko in Mughal, India, delves into the war of succession among Shah Jahan's children and paints a portrait of Aurangzeb's oldest brother, whose interest in the Upin Upanishads is something that interests me. And then we have Arsha Sata, translator of the Valmiki Ramayana, whose Mariada, searching for Dharma and the Ramayana, throws open the nuances and complexities of right action, as read from that epic text. Moderator par excellence, herself a widely published author, Rana Safi, is a chronicler, documenter, excavator of the culture of the heart of Delhi and its world, and she will hold the session together. As always, to the audience, please post your questions on the insider page and we will pass them on and filter them over to the moderator. Rana, over to you and the panelists. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much, Indra. And uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be part of such a brilliant panel and to be conversing with these fantastic scholars. And, uh, the session itself, passion and plurality, that itself is such a wonderful concept. Translation has always been a way of building bridges and of introducing people to different sensibilities and ideas which they could otherwise miss because of unfamiliarity with other languages. In fact, Akbar himself established a translation bureau and we see the Ramayana and the Mahabharata translated into Persian and his mother, Hamida Bano Begum, being one of the owners of a Persian Maha, of a Persian Ramayan and reading it. Today, interestingly, I'm talking to scholars and academicians who have also used translation for their work. So I'd like to start this, uh, I know you, want, you are waiting to hear them. I'd like to start it with one common question to each one of them, and I start al in alphabetical order with Arshia. And later on, I'll then ask specific questions related to their work. I want to first discuss translation in general. And my question to all three of you would be, why is translation important? And what role has it played in our lives? And here I refer to history, religion, mythology, which are the three areas that you work in. If I could start with you, Arshia. Um. Thank you, Rana, and thank you, Indira, and lovely to see both Supriya and Audrey. I mean, I cannot imagine a world without translation. I absolutely cannot. I cannot imagine how impoverished our lives would be, how impoverished our imaginations would be, and how little we would know about each other. I mean, I think if there is anything that works against prejudice, um, it is, um, it is the act of translation, making it and reading it. Um, and honestly, I get, I have very little patience with people who say, oh, lost in translation, 
oh, you know, I don't know, why should I trust you? I said, oh, good, then learn Sanskrit and go read the original text. You know, you're not going to do that, right? You're counting on all of us. Um, to make this easy and beautiful for you, it is already beautiful in and of itself, right? So, um, honestly, I, um, yeah, a world without translation would, for me, be um, a world almost not worth engaging with. Um, yeah, that's that's the answer. <laughs> is there a second part of the question? I'm sorry, I forgot. No, it did, or did you want me to specifically address mythology and religion? I wanted you to discuss translation in general first, and then we'll come to your specific oh, area of work. That's my translation manifesto. Cannot imagine a world in which we are so profoundly monolingual, monocultural, um, you know, uh, yeah, unable to access um, the minds and thoughts and loves of other people. Yeah. And that's a wonderful note to start this session on. Uh, Audrey? Thank you so much. Uh, it's really my pleasure to appear here on this, this great panel with uh, my, my friends and colleagues, Rana, Arshia, and Supriya. So I would start by saying that I want to sign on to Arshia's manifesto. I love it. Like, add my name, please. Um, I, when I think of translation, to say a few other things, I think of it as something that I've suffered from to some degree, something that I do, and something that I study. So I've suffered from it in the sense that I've spent a lot of time reading translations, and I use translations all the time, especially in teaching. Right? You, know, you can't just give undergraduate students Sanskrit texts. They, they tend to sort of balk at that. Um, and there's a lot of bad translations out there. And a lot of the materials that I work on, especially from the Indo-Persian period, really, we only have access to them in English in colonial era translations that are misguided and misguiding, often deliberately so. And these translations shape sort of, they've shaped a field of scholarship in which I work, and they also continue to actively shape popular perceptions. So tr translation can be a problem for me at times. Second, translation is something that I do. Most recently in the language of history, my most recent book, I have a series of appendices in the back of the book where I translate from specific Sanskrit histories of Indo-Persian rule. I think I have eight eight appendices, eight different texts that I translate excerpts from. In my own translations, I, I, I favor a colloquial style uh, that has earned me some intense criticism at times, although I do stand by it as a methodological choice. Last, translation is something that I study uh, most in depth in terms of Mughal translations of Sanskrit text into Persian. And in looking at that, that set of materials, what really has struck me is that there's no intrinsic meaning to translation. It can be a way to, it's, I guess it's always a way to access the thoughts of others and, and the, their ideas, but why you want to do that? There's a thousand different reasons. And so in trying to interpret and to figure out why would Akbar's court devote such intense resources to bringing Sanskrit texts into Persian and turning them into Persian literature? I've really had to rely on a wide variety of sources, as well as looking at the style and approach of translation in specific projects in order to, to try to recover to the extent possible the original motivations for those works. And from Akbar, of course, we come seamlessly to Supriya Gandhi and uh, her work. So how does uh, translation, uh, what role does it play in our lives? And what is your, uh, what are your thoughts on translation, Supriya? Um, thank you. And um, again, I would like to thank uh, Indira and Rana for convening this. And I'm thrilled to be here with my wonderful co-panelists. Um, so, so uh, for me, uh, translation is a lens. It's an inc incredibly useful lens that I think incorporates, of course, linguistic translation from one language to another uh, in terms of you know, whether written uh, or oral forms. Uh, but it's also a lens that uh, can be a metaphor that's a bit broader than that, that also encompasses uh, this, this kind of linguistic shifting. Uh, so, for instance, as um, a scholar of 
times past of, of, of early modern and um, sort of um, later periods in South Asian history, uh, we find ourselves uh, to be translators. We're trying, of course, to, to read primary works in the original languages uh, and access these sources. And of course, we, we're engaged in uh, sort of the, the, uh, the actual act of translating these. Uh, but we're also trying, seeking to understand categories uh, from the past, from a context that is different from ours, uh, and translate them into intelligible forms uh, for our interlocutors today. So I think, so as scholars, we're always engaged in acts of translation, whether or not we are translators ourselves. Uh, and secondly, uh, when one is working in a multilingual society, you know, uh, like South Asia, I think many South Asians uh, find that they are translators. One doesn't have to be a professional translator or, or a scholar. People working in multiple registers find themselves um, continually translating. Um, so, so again, I think it's a, uh, it's a great metaphor for not only what, what scholars do, but what people living in multi multilingual societies do. No, that's a great point. Yes, we live in a multilingual society, so we are constantly translating things around us. And uh, I remember I studied for a year in a, a in a Hindi medium school, and uh, I would, you know, write on my notes in English as as the teacher was giving the lectures. And I must have been quite young, and that is when I realized, uh, you know, how to translate and how to just, you know, seamlessly understand and trans uh, translate it into another language. Mm -hmm. So the, as I mentioned, I did this when I was quite young. And Arshia, you, apart from translating Valmiki's Ramayan for adults, you have written the hugely successful Mahabharat for children. Is it more difficult to write for children? And what were the differences in approach to your uh, two books, the Valmiki's Ramayan as well to the, to the Mahabharat? I also did a Ramayana for, for children, which came out a couple of years ago. So this Mahabharata is really on the tail of that. Um, one, of the, one of the great pleasures I've had in um, retelling these stories that so many of us already know for children is, um, and this was certainly true for Ramayana more than for Mahabharata, is, um, is working with a smaller vocabulary. You know, um, it doesn't mean it's a smaller vocabulary of the imagination. It's it's a smaller linguistic vocabulary because, you know, um, on the other hand, you must, I mean, I feel that you must constantly introduce new words to, to younger readers because they love new words. And the longer and more complicated they are, um, the, the more the more they love them, you know, uh, like bombastic is, is, a, is a childhood favorite of mine, certainly. Um, but bombastic is not a word you get to use very easily in Ramayana or Mahabharata. So um, what is, um, I loved, I loved writing the children's books. I think in a way, not only because they were for younger readers, but because they freed me from these texts to which I am contractually tied by virtue of being a translator. You cannot, as a translator, put in something that's not there. You have to be um, incredibly conscientious um, about how you move words from one language to another. You have to be very honest about the, your source text. Um, even if you don't like what it's saying, you have to be able to present that convincingly without letting your politics um, shadow the um, you know, the, the work moving from one language to another. When you're retelling, whether you're retelling for children or adults, you're completely free of that. Um, but if you're a good reteller, you never let go of that, um, of that apron string, really, the apron string, uh, which is, you know, to, to the mother load, as it were. Um, so it was nice to be, to be, um, you know, to be able to say, um, 
he charged down the street instead of he ran quickly down the street, you know, um, that even though you can do that as a translator as well, but there, there was a great freedom. Um, and I enjoyed it hugely because I, um, as uh, both my colleagues, you know, we are so tied to the integrity of the text, to the linguistic integrity of the text that we work with, um, that, yeah, it was fun. I was talking to Chiki Sarkar and uh, she has published your uh, Mahabharat and a couple of other books, I think. And uh, I also did a, see a book with her. and. I know that her son is a huge fan of your work. Yeah, God bless him. That's why she gave my second contract, you know. <laughs> if her son hadn't loved it, there would have been no Mahabharata. <clears throat> Audrey, your uh, first book, Culture of Encounters, documents the fascinating exchange between the Persian-speaking Islamic elite of the Mughal Empire and the traditional Sanskrit scholars which endangered a dynamic idea of Mughal rule essential to the empire's survival. What were your findings during your research and while you were writing this book? So I, if I could put my findings in a single short sentence, the Mughals were seriously interested in Sanskrit. That's, that's sort of what I found. Mm -hmm. And the interesting and fun part was figuring out why because it's not obvious that an Indo-Muslim empire would be that interested in Sanskrit texts. Um, and so, you know, I sort of started in the book, and I started, I should say, my research and writing in the book kind of documenting the various ways that this imperial interest in Sanskrit cult literary culture came out. And it came out in terms of patronage ties. The Mughals employed dozens of Sanskrit intellectuals to hang around the court and do various activities. It comes out in terms of translations, Sanskrit texts into Persian, and it also comes out in the sponsoring of Sanskrit texts, which is interesting since the Mughals could not read Sanskrit so far as, as we know and so far as I found. The, one of the earliest theories that I considered to explain this is a kind of classic historian's explanation, which is legitimation theory. Maybe the Mughals were trying to legitimate their rule. The problem with that theory is you have to have an audience for legitimation, right? You don't legitimate for yourself, you legitimate for, for somebody else. And I was never really able to identify a compelling audience. Many people might assume that, that the various Rajput lineages were interested in this stuff, and I found essentially no evidence of that from, from Akbar's period in particular. And so instead, what I argued in Culture of Encounters is that the Mughals were invested in Sanskrit literary culture in this myriad of ways as a sort of self-definitional exercise for themselves, that they were seeking what it meant to be an Indian empire, because they knew what it meant to be Timurids, and they knew what it meant to have Mongol, you know, a sort of Mongol line of descent that was all quite clear to them and well articulated and much discussed. And they weren't seeking to displace any of that, but they were seeking to add another layer, which is that they found themselves, you know, through sort of blood, sweat, and grit in control of a large land-based empire in Northern India. And so what did it mean to be, to be Indian kings? They're especially commenting on their translations of Sanskrit texts into Persian. Their translations were often very close, but not always. So in, in my research for Culture of Encounters, I spent a lot of time reading Sanskrit, the Sanskrit originals and the Mughal Persian translations side by side. I rarely lost my place, so it's relatively close, but every once in a while, the, the Mughal Persian translation would just completely go off the page and rewrite certain portions. This is more prominent in certain aspects of the epics than in others. And I think in those rewritings, you see especially a kind of active engagement in the Sanskrit tradition. This was not some sort of passive, oh, let's see what people, you know, a thousand years ago were thinking about in Sanskrit. For the Mughals, this was much more of a question of, these are texts that a whole lot of people in India care about. They comment on imperial rule and on sovereignty. How can they help us be Indian kings, right? So more, more of a sort of back and forth with the textual materials. The last thing that I'll say on, on Mughal era translations is that, especially for, is speaking specifically about Akbar's period, there is so much more that I didn't cover in Culture of Encounters. Even the epics alone, I did my best but huge portions of them I, I never even read 
the, the Mahabharata, for example, it's over 2000 pages of printed Persian texts. There are thousands of manuscripts of the Persian Mahabharata known as the Razamnama, the Book of War in India alone. If you start going outside of India, there, there's even more. And I viewed hundreds of those manuscripts, but not thousands. So there, there's a lot more research waiting to be done. That's a very interesting point that you make, that uh, they wanted to know what it meant to be Indian king. Supriya, you <clears throat> Supriya, your research examines the interface of Islam and Indic religions in South Asia. What I find very fascinating is that you translated the work of one of our famous translators, Dara Shuko, in your book on him, and I'm sure for your work also. What were the factors driving Dara while he translated the Upanishad, and how different were your motives and methods from him, if you have been able to understand that while translating him? Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to just start by placing Dara Shuko's project in context. And we already heard about some of that context from, um, from Audrey when you were talking about uh, the Akbar period translations, which was um, the beginning of this uh, absolutely mammoth exercise uh, that one sees. Um, uh, and and again, you know, uh, you know, with uh, Audrey, your pioneering work and some others, there there has uh, scholars are starting to really address this in detail. Uh, there's a lot more, of course, uh, that can be done. So on the one hand, there was this. Um, this mammoth cross-cultural translation exercise that was taking place uh, at the Mughal court uh, under Akbar continued under Jahangir. Even when Jahangir was a prince, he got a number of uh, Sanskrit works translated uh, into Persian. And, and if one kind of zooms out a little bit in, in the early modern period, one sees that this was really an age of translation certainly not the only age of translation that one has had in South Asia, but there is translation that is really, that is going on in so many locations. Uh, for instance, uh, in Bengal, uh, there is kind of the actual translation of works. There's also the translation of various uh, categories um, uh, in the Bengali language with works on yoga, works on the Prophet Muhammad, for, uh, for instance. Uh, there is uh, there is uh, translation uh, going on in uh, in Marathi uh, and you know and e even works that are kind of that may not be kind of literal translations but for instance works on yoga by Sheikh Muhammad for instance uh, there are translations going um, on between various South South Indian languages so. So the Mughal translations were one really key node in this. They also provide the, perhaps the impetus and the inspiration for other translation projects. Uh, but this, this, so this was a period where there were many of these translations taking place. And I think that, uh, that the Mughal court was, um, uh, was both informed by this general atmosphere of translation and contributed to it. Uh, later on, one has in the, uh, uh, in the Sikh courts, for instance, of Guru, uh, of, of Guru Gobind Singh, one has a number of translations that are, that are taking place. If you look at um, Raja Jaswan Singh, uh, he also has a lot of script uh, works that are translated uh, into, into Hindi. Um, these you know, might have been uh, influenced by the Mughal court, where uh, translation, again, is taking place on many levels, uh, but in, uh, it also is... Uh, it's an important imperial uh, activity of sort of imperial um, uh, royal uh, self-fashioning. Uh, so, so Dara Shuko's project comes in this much wider context. And previous Mughal rulers had, of course, sponsored all kinds of translations. So it meant there were many, there's a, in, in the Mughal library, he would have access to translations of the of the epics, translations of the yoga vasishtha, uh, of various stories and so on. So a lot of Sanskrit um, kind of literature and intellectual history was sort of was at his fingertips through these Persian translations. 
but Dario Shoko was trying to uh, in re uh, sort of invent the, uh, uh, the sort of this model of sacred sovereignty by also showing how unique he was. So he hardly ever or almost never refers to his forefathers in um, as role models in respectful terms. He sort of um, ignores them, but forges his own path uh, as, as the would-be ruler who, with special spiritual prowess. And he passes through various stages uh, of Sufi learning and, and towards, um, there's a phase towards the end of his career where he starts showing a really active interest in in Indic thought, uh, and it's clear that he's read, uh, you know, uh, he's familiar with Rama and Mahabharata and, and you know such such works. At perhaps the last phase of his career, he has come to Shah Jahanabad. He's taking a very active role in rulership alongside his father. They are both hosting Sanskrit pundits at the court. Kavindra Charya Saraswati makes over a dozen visits and gets you know, uh, handsome rewards. Uh, so he's hosting uh, this kind of uh, atmosphere of uh, intellectual exchange, and he really is delving very seriously into these Sanskrit works, and he sort of wants to do this anew. And initially, he he has very he has projects where he engages in dialogues with uh, uh, Hindu uh, sages, like such as such as Baba Lal, and he compiled one work, the Majmal Bahrain. Where, where he said, which he says was based on his dialogues with the Indian unity affirmers, the monotheists, those who affirm the unity of, uh, of the divine. But he passes through that phase. So for him, translation uh, is a way for him to engage in his spiritual path, but without necessarily relying on the authority of others. So when he actually has access to this font of pure monotheism that he considers the Upanishads, uh, he considers them a celestial book, you know, uh, like the Quran. And indeed, he says this is the celestial book that actually is what the Quran refers to as Kitab Maknun, the hidden book, that the Upanishads, um, which he refers to kind of, you know, as like a single scripture, even though there are many uh, Upanishads, that this unlocks the key to the secrets of the Quran, if one has access to it. So for him, translation is a way of unveiling this, of, uh, of having access to this particular text. So uh, whereas in his other works, he credits the important role of his spiritual teachers, whether his Sufi peers or Baba Lal and so on. With this, he actually has risen even above that. He has he now has access to this font of, of, of monotheism uh, and, uh, and can then actually have access to the secrets of the universe. There's a kind of a lot of um, uh, allusion to esoteric secrets, both with from the Upanishadic tradition as well as a broader tradition of you know, Islamic occult learning. Uh, so this was Dara Shugo's project. In terms of the actual translation, it's sort of similar to what Audrey was talking about. And I think this is a trend that we really see in these Persian translations of, of Sanskrit works. They're not going to deviate like really dramatically unless, you know, it's a sort of retelling and not something that doesn't style itself as a translation. But it's not what in our modern sense we would consider a word for word translation. There's a lot of um, uh, commentary that is uh, mixed into this, uh, you know, some people have uh, do see this as a as an early modern feature where translation and commentary sort of mingle. And later on in the colonial period, there are different philological practices, there are different ways of translating. Um, so much so that William Jones um, uh, denigrated the, the Mughal translations. He says it's just a mixture of kind of gloss and flimsy paraphrase. And uh, he also referred to these Persian translations as muddy rivulets, you know, something that is actually contaminating the original. Uh, this was not the sense of translation at all uh, in Darashuko's context. And uh, when you speak of William Jones, that 
brings me to a point that Audrey also referred to of uh, the translations that we read. Not many of us are uh, conversant with, with many, uh, languages such as Persian and Sanskrit. And most of the primary sources of the, the uh, I should say, the uh, medieval uh, Indian history as well as the modern, pre modern, was written in these two languages. So, how important is the, is, you know, for people, historians to know? and to read primary sources, because especially in these days when we see a lot of history being distorted and rewritten. So I would like to address that in my next uh, round. So uh, Arshia, you have explored the many dimensions of Ramayan, for example, in Mariada and the lost loves. Do you feel that when we read religious text, we see the heroic narrative of kings and warriors and the triumph of good over evil, but we sometimes forget the human side of the story and uh, why is it important to emphasize the human and the humane side of religious text oh absolutely um you know religious texts um whether it's the Quran or the Vedas or the Ramayana or the Bible, involve human agency, you know, however much they are revealed, however much they are not, uh, we believe, some people believe them to not actually originate in the human imagination, human beings are still involved in their recording, in their dissemination, in their um, understanding, in their, you know, common, commentary, commentatorializing um, and um, the other thing of course is that religious texts are typically addressed to human beings so I think it's a bit silly um, to take them out of what is essentially a human context they are meant for human beings to consider their larger place in the world to consider the meaning of life to understand um, what it means to be human, what it means to reach for the divine. Um, it's also true that certainly in the world of academia and scholarship, um, <clears throat> the person who approaches a religious text may not always be a believer. Um, I think certainly the three of us are reaching to texts that lie outside what you would normally call our own tradition. You know, if you can even say that about secular cosmopolitan human beings in the 21st century, right? Um, so, um, yeah, so it's possible that um, some of the most interesting work that is done on religious texts, some of the most interesting work done on religious texts is done by people who are not followers of that particular faith. Um, I think it's not necessarily that um, our work should be in conflict with um, uh, the, the beliefs, um, the ideas um, that followers of that religion will have. I think that when we are set up in an automatically contentious and uh, relationship of conflict, I think that's truly, truly unfortunate. Um, but yeah, I do think that we need to, you know, for me, one of the most moving, moving, moving stories in the Bible is, of course, the story of Jesus, right? Imagine, imagine, I mean, whenever I think of the Pieta, you know, the statue, she's holding the broken body of her child. Yeah, he's 30 years old. He's still her child. He has been physically brutalized. Yeah. I mean, nails been driven into his palms and into his feet. How can you not, how can you fail to be moved by that? It doesn't matter that he's the son of God. In that moment, you are responding to a mother weeping. This should not happen. You know, you should not be weeping for your dead child in any religion, in any part of the world, in any, any circumstance, yeah? Um, and so I feel also about Rama. Uh, for some people, he is God, uh, but that doesn't take away the pain that he feels when he's without his wife, when his wife has gone away, when she rejects him. Uh, the, the loneliness that he feels when he when he doesn't have his children. Why is it not possible to talk about this with immense respect and with a full sense of belief 
in, um, you know, in all of us being human together, you know, so I, it's very, very distressing to me that we are, we are allowed to talk about religious texts only in one way. And that one way is unfortunately always determined by the most narrow minded of the followers of, of that religion, you know, yeah. That's a very beautiful point that you put across and all of us, I think, uh, all the panelists here, we've all grown up in a very uh, multicultural and a very plural society and with a lot of uh, different uh, influences on us. Like in India, most of us who went to uh, convent schools, attended church, mass, we had friends and for us it was, you know, we were encouraged to read almost uh, every text and every religion. So I grew up knowing about and reading about all different religions and their scriptures as well, which is such a beautiful feeling to, uh, to know your own religion as well as to understand others and to know about different texts. So what you said really resonates and uh, understanding mm -hmm. the, I, you know, understanding the humane side as well as the human angle of every scripture. So Audrey, when uh, I'd like to come to you, uh, going back to the main question. Uh, when one talks of medieval Indian history, the emphasis and perception is mostly of Persian sources. In your new book, The Language of History, you seek to collect, analyze, and theorize Tuscan histories of Muslim-led and later as Muslim became an integral part of Indian cultural and political world, Indo-Muslim rule as a body of historical materials. Now that is something that is path-breaking. Please tell us more about it. Thank you for that question. And I will tell you more about it, but let me just comment very briefly on what Arshia said, because I thought it was sort of really important and beautiful. Um, and uh, at least for me, when you look at sort of public discourse about what we sometimes call the insider outsider issue in religious studies, right? Are you internal or external to a tradition? You look at public discourse and it's just the outrage machine led by people with a pretty narrow view, often with right wing politics. It, it's just very discouraging. You know, it's, it's arguing in bad faith. It's the same stuff over and over. Um, uh, in a very different context, which is in the classroom. However, I've actually had a lot of success talking to students very productively about this. I just taught about it last week to, to a class and there were some really great questions and points. And I, I teach at a very diverse university in America. So we have students from all over the place. We talked about what it means to be internal to a tradition, what questions you might ask if you're you know, speaking as a Hindu or as a Muslim versus if you're speaking not as that, but as a historian and what happens if you're speaking as both. So I think there, there is hope for, for these sorts of discussions and productivity, um, just perhaps not, not sort of you know, on Twitter or whatever. Anyways, but to turn to, to the language of history. So, this is my most recent book, and I argue that we have missed an entire archive for the study of the Indo-Persian of Indo-Persian rule, which is basically a set of, of Sanskrit historical materials. I deal with roughly three dozen Sanskrit texts in the book dating from the 1190s into the early 1720s. So if those dates sound familiar, that's more or less the span of Indo-Muslim rule. So as, as soon as the Ghurids roll into Northern India, someone's writing about that in Sanskrit, all the way through to the sort of cracking up of the Mughal Empire. And I argue in the book that the, these Sanskrit sources, that they are histories, they are also literature, not as some intermixture, but as fully both. And in arguing that I am sort of, I, I'm embracing a different sort of way of defining history and historicity in pre-modern Sanskrit thought. I do not argue that we should apply that to, to today. I am a 21st century historian and I'm very attached to being that. But I do think that older Sanskrit ideas about what it means to write about the past can put useful pressure on the modern writing of histories in certain ways and make us more, more attuned to our own reliance on narrative sometimes. In addition to that, a couple of, I would say the other couple of other key kind of points of the book, um, I'm very interested in Sanskrit views of the Muslim other, which as it turns out, are, is not, it's not an other all that often and it's even less frequently are they concerned with, with Indo-Persian rulers being particularly Muslim, right? That, those were not their terms of engagement. And so instead I tried to reconstruct 
if Sanskrit scholars over you know, roughly 500 years were not writing about a Muslim other in their own minds, well, who were they writing about? How did they define the, this, these sorts of waves of dynasties that when all was said and done, it did significantly change aspects of politics, culture, and society in throughout the Indian subcontinent. I'm sorry, my electricity has gone off, so <laughs> I'm in the. I don't know whether you can see me or not. And we are just trying to get that fixed. But uh, and I think I was off air for a bit, so I didn't hear your full answer, Audrey. I'll hear it later on when I see the recording. So sorry about that. But then this is India. We keep managing. Supriya, you are completing a book on religious cultures in the 17th century India and are writing a book on the formation of modern Hindustan, Hinduism, sorry, on modern Hinduism. In an article you wrote for the Social Science Research Council in, on this book, you write, I turn to these ruptures and fields of contestation to reflect on the lineaments tying political Hinduism to the subcontinent Mughal past and with its changing motions of secularism. Can you elaborate on this for us, please? Yes, I'm sorry, that's a bit of a mouthful. Thank you, sir. thank you, and um, sorry, Rana. Um, I, I'm, going, I'm going to do this. I just sort of, again, I was also very moved by what Arshia, by, by what you were saying, and uh, it reminded me uh, of, of an incident that I had in my own life um, in 2004, where I was in Syria and I was in this monastery called Mar Musa. And it was a monastery where there were some, some old frescoes that had been restored. There were both Christians and Muslims going there. And it was run by an Italian, one Father Paolo. And he, and I remember that he, um, we were having this discussion, we were having this discussion all, all in classical Arabic, and um, he was talking about God's suffering and the idea, kind of the Christian idea that, you know, the, that God can suffer. And there were Christians and Muslims present, you know, in this sort of medieval monastery. And, and then he asked me, if there was something similar to that from the Indic tradition. And I sort of, and I thought of Ram and, and Ram's exile and Ram's suffering. Uh, and I, and I um, brought, brought that up. So, so it was just this, this amazing experience where we could speak about Ram, speak about Jesus, speak in class, in Arabic, in Syria. And, you know, and Syria, of course, isn't like that any, uh, it, it's, it's a war ravaged um, uh, country. Father, and, and this person with, who was facilitating this encounter has has since been killed. So it was just it, it was it's very different and it and uh, but it it sort of poignantly reminds me of of the need to have multicultural conversations and translations uh, in a society. So so Rana, the question that you asked me uh, also evokes to my mind a period. Uh, in South Asia that was very different from the period that we have now. Obviously, you know, like it wasn't like just all complete harmony and, you know, pluralism and so on. Uh, but this is a period where many, many Hindus uh, of a variety of, uh, you know, caste um, backgrounds used Persian as the main literary language. Uh, and just as Audrey has looked at a segment of texts that are otherwise uh, passed over or overlooked, and then they give us this totally new perspective on, on South Asian history. Uh, I believe that these works circulated and produced by Hindus in Persian and Urdu can give us new insights into the history of modern Hinduism. Uh, so as the Mughal Empire decentralized, there were still many, many Hindus who were using Dara Shuko's Upanishad translation, for instance, using translations done during Akbar's time, producing their own translations, circulating these works. So th these Mughal projects, which were imperial projects, had a very unexpected consequence. They became to be, in they came to be influential 
in shaping the ways in which many Hindus um, accessed uh, their sacred texts. Uh, so there were ways in which this shaped the course of um, uh, of modern Hinduism in 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 uh, in some ways. Again, I'm not I'm not saying this is the only uh, influence or the only kind of current of what was going on. Uh, but it's certainly uh, an influential and an overlooked one. Uh, so that so that's my lens for this next book. This has been such a fascinating conversation with the three of you, and each one your perspective is so different and so refreshing, and something which is really needed today. And uh, translation in itself is also not such an easy task. And I quote. Uh, John Chardy uh, in an introduction to his translation of Dante's Inferno, who wrote, when the, la when the violin repeats what a piano has just played, it cannot make the same sound, and it, it can only approximate the same sound. It can, however, recognizable, make the same music, the same air, but it can do so only when it is faithful to the self-logic of the violin, as it is to the self-logic of the piano. Now, I translate uh, accounts written in the late 19th century from Urdu to English, and I often have this problem of, you know, understanding the nuances and how to translate very small uh, cultural nuances from one language to another, because so many times there are no words in the language, maybe say for from Urdu to English, some of the words in Urdu don't have uh, uh, approximate, uh, appropriate word, and I end up using that and then trying to explain, you know, it in the footnotes. And this is where knowing different scriptures helps. This is where knowing many languages and knowing the different uh, the ways in which other people, you know, work in their cultures really helps a lot. So my question to you would be uh, the challenges of being a translator and the high point in your journey of translation. Also, how fit essential is it to be exactly faithful to the translation something that we've discussed during this uh, the course of this uh, conversation today so ashia to start with you well actually um i think it's very important to work towards the logic of your target language you know the inherent um logic of a target language you know left branching right branching where do we put our adjectives where does our verb fit that's what we have to reach for because you are translating for the text to appear in all its beauty in the in the target language right so um, for the source language i feel that you know we always have dictionaries we have other translations um, all of us have read multiple, multiple other translations before we embark our, on our own work. And people say, oh, you read other translations? I'm like, yeah, of course I read other translations. I want to know how other people have dealt with this material. I want to know when they do it right. But also very important, as Audrey said right at the beginning, I want to know when they've done it wrong. You know, um, and and that, I think that's that's very important for a translator, um, first of all, to place herself in the context of past translations. Yeah, none of us is born out of an egg. You know, we can't pretend that like, oh, I'm the first one to translate Ramayana. No, and it would be foolish to not acknowledge the long um, tradition of translating this text, right? So as a translator, I think one of the skills you must develop is the difference, and is the skill to know the difference between a good translation and a bad translation, right? Um, as far as fidelity goes, um, um, again, um, you know, when you translate something, you are never just tr translating Ramayana or Upanishads, whether they're in Persian or Sanskrit or anything, you are translating also Mahabharata, for me, certainly, right? Um, I need to know what other texts were written around the same time. What is the language that everybody was using? Not because I'm, you know, I have the 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 hubris to say, oh, I'm translating a whole culture. On the contrary, I'm still translating a single text, right? But the fidelity is to the spirit of that time. That is what is fidelity. It's not about, you know, I mean, Sanskrit naturally uses a passive voice. Uh, it's very beautiful in Sanskrit. It sounds like rubbish in English, right? Um, so if you translate into English, 
for that passive voice, that is a huge mistake. I mean, again, Audrey said at the beginning that, you know, she prefers a more colloquial um, idiom for her work. Um, we must always translate into the idiom of the time in which we are writing, you know? So every 20 years, we need a new translation. How brilliant is that? I mean, I, I'm not upset that, you know, somebody else has a new Ramayana translation. I'm like, yay, go for it. You know, and for people who can't read the original language, it is what a gift to have multiple translations, you know, because I mean, you know, instead of spending all that time reading the translations, you just learn Sanskrit, it would be quicker and easier, yeah, for you to access the original text. But never mind, you know, we all want to read in the language which, which we feel most comfortable. So for me, fidelity is, um, is to a time and a place and the spirit of writing, um, you know, all the context that uh, Supriya provided for Dara Shuko's um, work, you know, where, and all the, the, you know, the multiplicity of translations that emerged from the so-called Mughal uh, translation, these are the important things, you know? These are the truly, truly important things. And this, I think, is what makes better and worse translators. Uh, uh, a limited translator will translate only the text that she is working on. It's not going to work. It is not going to work. It just isn't, you know? So. <clears throat> Any high point that you'd like to discuss in your journey of translation? Something that wow moment when you feel, oh, I've cracked it. Oh, God, so many, so many. Um, you know, because translation is, as you said, scary and lonely, um, uh, except that, you know, uh, you're never alone because you are inhabiting a universe of many people and many voices when you're translating a text. But um, if I get one wow moment, like a month when I'm translating, I, it's, 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 it's unbelievable, you know. And really, honestly, honestly, many, many of the wow moments come when you're editing you know because when you're when you're grappling with a really difficult piece of sanskrit or whatever language it is you're working on when you work through the grammar and you get it just like oh okay that's a relief but when you make it shine when it becomes a jewel yeah. in your hand yeah. that is the wow moment and that is many many iterations down in the editing process yeah that's so wonderful audrey what about you we'd love to know your thoughts so I find so many challenges with translation and I, I do take heart though that that's not new. So when I look back at the Mughals and their translation efforts, they had all kinds of problems. In Akbar's court, for example, there's a moment where one of the translators of the Razam Nama, the Persian Mahabharata, is accused of mistranslating. And there's sort of a like mini translation trial in Akbar's court to adjudicate this question. There's also moments where the Mughals get it wrong. I have, a, I have a whole running you know, document listing errors in the Mughal translations. They misidentify gods, they misread the Sanskrit, like, you know, it, it happens. It, it happens to everyone, right? We can all take heart in this. I think that for me, you know, one, one thing that I try to do to, as, as a modern translator is to be as attuned as possible to the sort of target language and what you're translating into, including different registers of that language. Um, and in, in my most recent book, The Language of History, so I have a U.S. edition of the book and an Indian edition, and there are actually a couple of differences in the translations between the two editions that I introduced, right, because one is for people who read and speak American English, and the other is for people who read and speak Indian English, and there are differences between the, those two. In terms of being faithful to a text, of course, I strive to be faithful. All translators do. That's sort of that's built into that's like the social contract of translating a text. Um, I I do strongly believe, though, that translation is not just to the linguistic meaning of the words. And Arshia knows this, especially for Sanskrit. This is a huge problem. So many people think that you just look stuff stuff up in Opte or you know, God forbid, Monier Williams, which should really never be used except as a door stopper, and like then you're fine. You just you know you get the words, everything's good, and that's not true. You have to pay attention to the cadence and the sounds and the use of tropes and the wider context and all, all of these things. So faithful, yes, but faithful to all of it to the extent possible. 
in terms of a high point of translation, so I had trouble with this one and I actually didn't come up with a high point. So I'm gonna tell you a sort of like challenging point instead, if that's all right, Rana. Um, so a challenging point of translation came for me about six months ago. So the context is that I was finishing an article and this was an article that I inherited from Professor Allison Bush, who uh, left us in 2019, she died of cancer. She left behind an article that was sort of half finished, sort of halfway there on Sanskrit and Hindi in Mughal context. I was asked to finish this article and I was of course thrilled to be able to, you know, sort of make this final gift to one of my mentors and teacher. In reading and sort of going through the article, there was one verse in particular that was, it was a translation of a Braj Pasha verse. And there was one line where Allison had marked that she, she didn't know what was going on in this line. Like she translated most of the verse, but not this one sort of line. And I read this and my heart just sank. It, you know, if, if Allison can't figure this out, there's no way I'm gonna figure it out. And I'm also like, I'm set up to fail because she's not here, I can't ask her, right? I can't, I can't run what I might think about it by her. So in this sense, I'm trying to be faithful to both the Braj Pasha verse, it's, you know, from the 17th century, but I'm also trying to be faithful to Alison Bush's voice as a translator. And so I did what I imagine anyone would have done in my situation, which is I called in reinforcements. And I sent the verse around to numerous scholars of Braj Pasha, and I, I essentially sort of crowdsourced all of this. I got a bunch of people to send me their thoughts on the verse, possible translations. And then I put it all together. And I, of course, footnoted what I had done so that anyone who reads this is aware of sort of the process behind this particular translated line. And to me, that's one of the key ways forward with translation, which is cooperation and working together. And that's actually a, a very important point of working together and helping each other. And uh, your the ch uh, challenges, of course, all of us face all the time. And it's all obvious, always better to be upfront and to seek help. So thank you for that. Supriya, what about you? Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd sort of just like to sort of riff off of what um, Audrey just related and that too, that's, you know, so poignant hearing that about uh, Alison Bush. I think, you know, those of us who knew her are still kind of getting used to the fact that she's um, no longer around. Um, I, I, I love the idea of, of translation as, uh, you know, collaboration. And I, uh, I actually wish there was, there was more of this. Uh, I don't, I don't partic I don't have any specific anecdotes of, um, high points or low points, for instance, you know, of course, I think the, the process is very similar to what, you know, all translators, um, uh, no, you're you're trying to uh, to get a sense uh, of the original text. Sometimes it's uh, easy and clear. At other times, one has to decipher the script. Often, a lot of the things that um, uh, that that I translate, whether to use in publications or whether you know just as part of my notes, uh, these are unpublished um, sources. Uh, so one has to make make sense of you know the manuscript, deciphering it. Uh, sometimes comparing it with others uh, and then and then translating it and of course trans uh, translating something to sort of get the sense of, of that is is different from producing a translation to then uh, share with others uh, there's a balance to be struck between uh, evoking the uh, the source text uh, and then striking the right register in uh, in the in the target language so uh, I, I personally like, uh, also I like translations that give some flavor of the source text uh, uh, without being, you know, too stilted or clunky. And it's a very difficult balance to, to strike. Uh, another challenge is, of course, uh, Rana, and this is something that you were mentioning, how to translate without copious footnotes. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's possible uh, to do that. Uh, and at other times it's, you know, particularly hard, you know, for instance, I'm sort of been turning back to a, a sort of draft translation that I've done of Dara Shukur's Majmal uh, Bahrain. And he's making all these kinds of comparisons um, and all these mental steps. Uh, so to, 
to unpack that one really needs a commentary uh, along with the uh, with the translation. Uh, now, of course, that's that's something that is that is sort of elevated and valued today. The, a translation that stands by itself. Um, Pre-modern translations often incorporated um, commentary in them. Um, That's a wonderful point. And all three of you work with manuscripts, which itself must be a challenge because, uh, you know, reading old manuscripts, that also is an art. So mm -hmm. that is also a very challenging uh, pro aspect of your work and wonderful work that you all are doing. And I'm sure viewers who have been hearing us must be having many questions. So over to you, Indira. Thank you, Rana. I'm uh, sort of coming in with some questions uh, from the audience. Yes, many people have been listening. There's been a lot of uh, response and resonance. People are really relating to much of what you're saying about both the emotional aspect as well as the uh, the importance of uh, translation, emotional meaning individual people's responses to different things. Um, one question that's come up uh, is actually sort of interesting, which was about the language that was used in the Mughal court. Uh, people are saying, was there an equal use of, a uh, question is saying, uh, was there an equal use of Sanskrit and Persian? Uh, did they coexist in any way or was it only in Persian? And so since we're speaking about translations, that might be a good question to uh, respond to. And Phil Lacuni and people's knowledge. So I, I can comment on this for Akbar's period, and then maybe Supriya can talk about when we get to Dara Shako's period. So I would not say that these were equal languages. Uh, for one thing, Sanskrit was not understood. By Mughal elites, with very few exceptions. Really, one exception: Abu Fazl may have understood some Sanskrit. That, that's about it. You know, Akbar may have been able to appreciate recited Sanskrit in sort of a melodious fashion, but I don't think he had sort of understanding linguistically of the language. Um, so Sanskrit was present as this sort of intellectual language, but it was something that was always mediated and had to be accessed. And in fact, that's what made the translations necessary. Now, just because Sanskrit was not the equal of Persian doesn't, that's not tantamount to saying it was unimportant or we can just forget about it or, or not study it, of course. Um, but we also don't want to sort of overstate the case, I would say. Thank you. Uh, Supriya, did you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, so I definitely um, would, have, uh, would have second uh, what, uh, what Audrey is saying. Uh, Hindavi was far more common uh, than Sanskrit was. Uh, so Sanskrit was the language of a certain uh, learned elite. Now, it doesn't mean that it didn't penetrate into other spheres of life. Uh, I think what was much more common was a familiarity with certain Sanskrit terms, um, rather than a full knowledge of the language and its grammar and so on. Certainly, that's what Dara Shuku seemed to have had. Uh, again, I don't know how much, uh, he probably didn't know a whole lot of Sanskrit, but he came to be familiar with, um, with certain terms uh, and ideas, uh, a lot of which were mediated through Hindavi. So Hindavi was sort of, uh, you know, perhaps more an equivalent uh, to Persian, uh, if we're talking about multilingualism uh, at the court. Uh, and the presence of Sanskrit was there, uh, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that Mughal elites were, were learning or um, quoting Sanskrit all the time. Um, thank you. May I jump in with a question, Rana, myself? <laughs> yes, please do. <laughs> yes, I mean, apropos this and the mention of Hindvi and uh, the... Um, I was so curious, Audrey and Supriya, um, I suppose Arsha too, really, in that sense, uh, the evolution uh, of Sanskrit in the Mughal court over the period that you were uh, looking at these texts, Audrey, must have also been very interesting. Surely over this period, language has evolved like any other, and the views, expressions, so I'm curious about, would you catch a comment? That's an interesting question. 
I'm not sure I could point to any evolution within sort of Sanskrit itself. Uh, keep in mind that, that Sanskrit is, as a sort of system of intellectual and philosophical thought, uh, fairly resistant to the idea of evolution, right? It's supposed to be unchanging, which it was not, but it perhaps did slow the change over time. So we do have Sanskrit texts that we don't, we can't say within, you know, more than a several hundred year period when they were written. Um, but I think what you do see is this evolution that Supriya was pointing to of greater familiarity with Sanskrit terms in Persian. And in this sense, um, I don't know if, if Arshia would like the, the sort of Mughal translations because they use a lot of Sanskrit vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And the way that this works in the Akbar period translations is a term is, def is often, not always, but often defined on its first use. And after that, you're expected to know it. And so by the time you get to book two of the Mahabharata, you're expected to know hundreds, possibly thousands, I've never counted them, of Sanskrit terms, which are sort of, to, to a Sanskritist eyes, they look kind of butchered. Um, the translations actually were done via Hindavi. So the Sanskrit scholars read it, the text in Sanskrit, they translated it verbally into Hindi, and then the Persian scholars heard it in Hindi, their shared language, and wrote it down in Persian. So the Sanskrit forms have a sort of vernacular like bent to their pronunciation. And then they're written in Perso-Arabic script, um, generally without diacritic marks. So how people pronounce these is, is a little bit unclear. Um, but you, you, so you definitely then over time, you see a kind of building on this. And I think as Supriya was pointing out, by the time you get to Dara, this is sort of something that one can draw upon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, can I respond to that, Indy, please? Uh, to what Oji said. Um, yeah, you know, um, uh, when, uh, when I did my Ramayana translation, one of the words that I steadfastly refused to translate was dharma. Yeah, uh, because I was like, you know, if you're, this whole book is about dharma, right? You're going to spend 700 pages in this abridged translation reading about dharma. I trust you, dear reader, to develop your own sense of what this very complicated and very important word means, you know? So I, I love that, actually, um, about, uh, uh, you know, again, one of the, the one of the possibilities of translation. You know, how much do you include your reader in, in the enterprise? Do you say, okay, baby, here it is, pablum, eat. Or do you say, come on, work with me, you know, chew a little bit, yeah? Um, just uh, get your own teeth into this because it, it's going to be worth the, the reward, um, as it were. So, yeah, I, I really like this idea that you know, by the time we get to book two of like, you know, Farsi Mahabharata, suddenly, you know, like you have 25 Sanskrit words and very important ones too. I, I love that. Mm. And that's a wonderful idea, you know, involving your reader in the process. And I think most yeah. of us who are translating yeah. do somewhere or the other end up doing that. Mm -hmm. So there's a, um, a question which so, from the audience, which also relates to something I was thinking about, which was, you, you know, I uh, very much appreciate the flow of today's session. I mean, I love that we started with translation and what it means to each of you and, uh, and then moved on to, in a way, the causes for translation or what motivates translation. I, I, it was very interesting. And um, you talked, uh, Audrey, about self-identification uh, as indie rulers, uh, that's which is might have, might have been one of the big motivators for uh, the Mughals. Uh, and uh, I wondered about glorification as well. And in a sense, I suppose through Supriya's uh, um, analysis of Dara Shiko's motivations, that that. Uh, sense came through um, that it was a little bit about the self and the ego and um, you know who you are as an individual who's who's doing this um, and, but so the question from the audience is uh, why did uh, Dara uh, choose to write uh, did why did he not do his memoir like his predecessors which um, uh, yes maybe could relate to all of that Um, sure, yes. So it's, um, so we have, of course, uh, Babur who, who wrote his, uh, his memoirs. Um, uh, and, the, and again, you know, there's, there, there is, there is the work that seems just like kind of the hasty jotting downs, but of course, there is a sort of literary fashioning of this uh, that takes place. Uh, and we have, um, 
uh, we have Jahangir's uh, memoirs. We have Akbar who didn't do that. Uh, he had Abul Fazl sort of do that for him. Again, not memoirs, but uh, again, a, a foundational um, uh, text that was uh, crucial to his uh, persona and his rule. Uh, so, so Dara Shuka didn't do that. Now, Dara Shuka was a prince who was really acting as though he was already a ruler. And his father had given him you know, quite a bit of encouragement uh, to do so. Uh, but uh, so Dara Shuka didn't have an Abul Fazl to sort of, uh, you know, kind of uh, blow his trumpet for him. But he, um, he has an element of spiritual uh, autobiography in his Sufi work, Sakinatul Olia, and he includes some of that in the prefaces to his other works. So he doesn't completely abstain from, from this, uh, but his, his works are, um, writings are far more targeted than, uh, than the memoir, say, for instance, of his grandfather, Jahangir. Would anyone else like to comment on this whole idea of um, of the glorifications and glorification? Okay, other people uh, did it for them. Um, someone asks about the similarity in language between Hindi and Urdu, and. Um, a lot of people are saying they're going to buy your books, which is, or at least read your books, if not necessarily buy them, motivated by today's uh, discussion. So that is really exciting. Um, and um, yes, maybe we can go from that and then, um, oh, and there is an interesting question about court-sponsored translations as opposed to other translations. I mean, could, well, you, could well, you elaborate on that, please? Uh, just uh, whether whether a translation that came up, I suppose it would lead back to a question of were, were there translations that did not occur that were patronized by the Mughal courts? And, um, you know, what, were they different? I don't really understand why, uh, but I suppose the question is, how were translations affiliated with the court different from those that were not affiliated with the court is the question. I think here it must be that Ramayana and Mahabharat were court sponsored translations, mm -hmm. whereas uh, what uh, Dara Shiko was doing was uh, on his own, uh, out of his own inclinations and interests. So maybe, and there must have been other, maybe there may have been other translations which were done out of an interest of somebody wanting to, you know, translate a particular, may not have been, not necessarily religious, but any text that they translated. I think Audrey, you might have come across that. So, so absolutely. Uh, there, there are translations from sort of all different quarters. Um, it's, it's not always, it's not always so clear to distinguish court sponsored and not because you do have translations that are dedicated to the courts. And the Ramayana is a good example of that. We've been talking thus far about the Akbari Ramayan, but that was only the first, um, and Supriya has, has worked on this as well. There are about two dozen distinct Persian renderings of the Ramayana. Many of those, were, most of those were done outside of courtly contacts, but a number of them were dedicated to the Mughal kings, including Jahangir and Aurangzeb as well. Um, so, you know, how do they differ? In every way you can imagine, and there are also similarities. Um, and I think you really have to speak more specifically about, you know, who's sponsoring a translation and why and what their particular interests are. Mm. Yes, thank you. I suppose it leads one to think about um, patronage in current times of translations as well. But that's a whole other <laughs> that's a whole other discussion. So maybe we shouldn't go there. <laughs> maybe Supriya can comment on uh, whether. The Upanishads were a, and uh, were a court-sponsored uh, translation, or was was it done by Darashiko out of his own interest? Yeah, the personal uh, project. Uh, 
Right. Um, so I, I th thank you. I would definitely consider this uh, court sponsored. Uh, Dara Shuko was operating his own kind of intellectual salon in Delhi. He had a mansion that was uh, near, uh, you know, his um, father's quarters uh, at the at the fort, uh, and he and he was doing this with the at least the tacit uh, encouragement of his father. Uh, who was also propping him up to be the heir. So I would definitely consider what Darashuka was doing uh, to be a court-sponsored one. I mean, he was it was his influence at court that brought all the, the pundits from uh, Banaras to come and sit and kind of help him with the translation. Uh, but, uh, you know, as, as Audrey was mentioning, there were a whole range of others that were not um, overtly sponsored by someone at the court. Uh, and yet taking some, often taking part in that process of translation was a way of uh, establishing some kind of connection with this, uh, not only this very prestigious language um, of Persian, uh, but with a kind of, uh, of vocabulary that was developing uh, at the court. Uh, so I think there was these these implicit links, not always, but sometimes that took place with the court. So one often finds people uh, on the fringes of court circles who produce these translations. There was uh, one Sheikh Sufi um, who seems to have been a, a mansardar. He was associated with Jahangir and Shah Jahan, and he produced a lot of translations of Indic texts, very brief ones. Uh, or Abdul Rahman Chishti, uh, who's a Sabari Chishti. Um, again, he had some uh, some links with the court, but wasn't, you know, actively, he was a Sufi, he wasn't actively uh, taking part in, in its activities. So there's a whole spectrum that one can see. What about Behrul Hayat, uh, the yoga text uh, by Sheikh uh, Mamad Qas Gwalior? Was that also a court translation? Uh, you, yes, I mean, so the, that, would, that is a translation that uh, was actually carried out earlier. Um, it, uh, and I think, and there are a whole range of these as well, you know, there's, uh, there's the Rushnama, for instance, there is, uh, which isn't exactly a translation, but, you know, it kind of is a text that it brings together the Quranic verses, you know, Hindavi, Persian, uh, and so on, and so on. Uh, so the, I mean, the, the Mughals were not the first to, uh, uh, to actually uh, promote this kind of activity. Thing which is uh, remarkable, of course, is about so many of these uh, texts from the Mughal period and uh, and earlier and um, later, uh, is the illumination. I mean, they're also um, visually exquisite, right? All of the art that goes with it and all of the drama. Um, and I was curious, Audrey, you said that uh, in some ways the uh, um, Persian translations often deviated from the original in sort of drastic ways. Is there a particular sort of arena in which they deviate or is it just the imagination of that particular translator that seems to have taken over or that translating school that takes over at that moment? You know, is it, is it an adventure or is it, uh, you know, ap apropos religious text or? That's a great question. So I would identify a couple of different sort of arenas and, and reasons for deviation. One, and this is particular to the Akbar period translations. This looks very different with, with Dara Shikoh. But there is an aversion in some translations to talking about religion in any kind of in-depth way, especially sort of anything sort of related to kind of philosophy. I think the, the best example of this is that in the Mahabharata translation done in Akbar's court, the Bhagavad Gita is shortened to just a couple of pages. There is just no interest in that. Um, and that is how I read it. It's, it's not a sort of maligning of Hindu thought. It's not a sort of, but it is a sidelining of it, as, as of saying this is not relevant for the purposes for which Akbar's court is paying to translate this text. Where you see the greatest rewritings, I think, again, drawing from the Mahabharata translation, are in the sections where, where Pishma, you know, after the Great War, Pishma is on his bed of arrows and is giving you Dishra ruling advice, right? And for those of you who are familiar with this work, you know that that section goes on at like quite some, some length. Parts of that are seriously rewritten 
and it's it's actually longer in the Persian translation relative to the rest of the text than in the Sanskrit text, which is extraordinary because it's like unbelievably long in Sanskrit. Um, and I think that the reason why there was a more active engagement in rewriting there is because that stuff really mattered to the Mughals, right? That that was like the good stuff that they wanted to get at about rulership and kingship and how do you rule in difficult circumstances like that. That was highly pertinent to them. Um, mm. The last thing that I'll mention, many of the translations from Akbar's period were done by teams of people. Mm -hmm. And so a question does arise, this question of style, and can you identify an individual's voice? Mm -hmm. And I've never been able to do this with any degree of certainty, so I've never been able to publish it, um, but I have had suspicions. Uh, and so I'll just, I'll just mention one. So Badawni, who was this courtier in Akbar's period, but now he's most well known for writing this secret and incredibly lively and critical history of Akbar's period, a true delight of a primary source to work with. All right, the guy worked for Akbar, but really hated him. Um, he was also Akbar's most prolific translator. And we know from his own reporting that he translated two of the 18 books of the Mahabharata. Now, among other things, Badawni was very seriously into Persian poetry. His, his history, this you know, secretly written history of Akbar's period is just laced with great quotations of Persian poetry, right? Like the guy was a true literati, true connoisseur. There are two books of the Persian Mahabharata that are heavily interlaced with quotations of Persian poetry from Hafez and Sa'di and Rudaki and Ferdowsi and sort of all these greats of the Persian literary canon. I have always suspected that those were the two books that Badawni translated, but I can't prove it. Thank you. <laughs> um, and it sounds fascinating to hear that, you know, the Mahabharata is uh, uh, interspersed with Sadi and Firdosi. <laughs> So, and let me just add that that's actually an area of research that like awaits further work. I identified a number of poets that are quoted, but the vast majority of quotations of Persian poetry in the Razam Nama remain unidentified. I suspect at least some of that is from Indo-Persian poets, and it's just harder to, to track down those quotations. So if anyone's looking for a good research project. Okay. I hope somebody is listening. Yes, really. I hope uh, somebody doesn't decide to then put in a contemporary poetry into retellings of uh, contemporary retellings of the epics that could be very, very wild. <laughs> I think that is where Arshia can come in. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but actually, um, I'm, I'm sort of so... Uh, so excited that this this idea of how much uh, how porous uh, linguistic boundaries are in yes. the Mughal courts that you can you can bolster uh, the Mahabharata with you know Persian poetry or that you know um, you can end up knowing so many more Sanskrit words by the time you finish reading uh, Darashuko's um, Upanishads and I also am very very um, uh, in, in a completely different context, in a non-academic context, uh, I've been working um, um, on collaborative translations, um, and yeah, they are just so much fun. And I think you actually end up with with a better with a better work. And, you know, I was thinking about this that. I mean, so much of the way we've learned to translate that, oh, there is a standalone translation, and here's the commentary, and ne'er the twain shall meet. These are all things that we've inherited from 100 years ago. Um, the world has changed. I mean, your beautiful story about translating for Alison, we can now share our world, you know, and our, um, our concerns so much more easily than, like, even our teachers couldn't, right? And I mean, let, that, I, we should just be translating differently. We should be presenting texts. Um, it is a new century, you know, and I mean, we have, I think it's, it's sort of, we're almost obliged to think about the way we present the past in, in, a, in a more dynamic and more sort of diverse way. So I'd really be interested in, you know, those, those kinds of um, developments in, you know, as we translate and present texts. Well, I think that there are some other questions about, um, you know, which, which have already been addressed, but I'll just read them out, you know, were some works tweaked in translation or in order to emphasize the kingship of rulers? Um, I think you talked a little bit about uh, 
or the translate the emphasis on Bhishma's advice to Yudhishthira, for example. Um, and so, um, and then there's another one on, uh, you know, relating to that, like Ramayana glorifying Lord Rama as Madhyada Purushottam. And so, um, I think most of those have already more or less been addressed. Uh, but there's one question, last question that comes in, which says, uh, which is your favorite translated work and why <laughs> to each of you? And so if you feel like answering that, uh, have something to respond to that would be fun. Um, someone who's commented all along on the pleasure of being part of the session. So I think it'd be nice. Um, <laughs> And uh, my favorite translated work changes every decade or every, you know, six or seven years. The more you read, um, you know, you're always going to find a gem um, of a translation. I mean, I think right now many, many women readers are just like, oh, Elena Ferrante, you know, um, and her translator, whose name I've even forgotten, shame on me. Um, but before, I mean, I, I hold a very special place for Magda Jabo's The Door. Um, you know, so when, when uh, yeah, I can't imagine having one forever favorite um, translation or even one forever favorite text, even though I spent 30 years with Ramana, you know, I do like other books, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Priya, Audrey, do you have a response to that? <laughs> I would be very hard pressed to name a specific translation, uh, but I would say my favorite series right now is easily the Murti Classical Library of India, which is translating texts from a, a wide variety of Indian languages and printing them sort of on FOSS with the, the original text. Uh, which is wonderful. A lot of, you know, these are, some of these are texts that have never been translated. Others haven't been translated in a very long time. I love the forefronting of primary source material, both in translation to make it accessible, but also in the original language, um, which is helpful for students um, as, as well as scholars. And it is also just a good reminder of the importance of primary source research in reading original languages. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I, I would, um, I'd love to sort of also to make a, a plug just for the importance uh, of translation. Translation is an activity that isn't always uh, rewarded or, or appreciated by universities uh, in the United States. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, I think our conversation speaks to really the need for more and more translations. Not everyone can spend years studying languages. Uh, we ought to have lots of translations uh, from South Asia again, made available in English and as well as South, other South Asian languages. Uh, so it's, this is an activity that I hope uh, we can start changing minds about. Uh, and in terms of my favorite translator, again, it's impossible for me to, to pinpoint anyone. But one, one translator who's, um, most of whose translations actually don't seem to have actually have been published, but whose model I've always admired since my my PhD days is is Wheeler Thaxton, uh, who has just the uh, most amazing ability to translate from lots and lots of languages. Um, you know, he uh, often, when asked how many languages he knows, he says, "Well, I've forgotten more languages than you'll ever learn." Uh, and he just, um, you know, he sits down every day and just and produces uh, these translations. So, yeah, you know, that so that is a kind of role model for a translator. And again, someone who has really done a lot of trans translating during his time in the academy. So I hope we can do more of that. And maybe collaboration is the way to go. You know, every time I hear of libraries, uh, especially in uh, uh, Amad region full of Persian books, I wish people would go and translate them. There are so many accounts of, you know, travels and travelogues and, you know, of memoirs, which are just of just people who may, you know, aren't even famous and nobody may know about them. And I just wish people, you know, that there are more and more scholars come up and translate. But unfortunately, I think the people who know Farsi and Sanskrit both are a very exclusive club now. 
Yes, well, I think we're coming sort of to the close of the session. And I just wanted to say, uh, yes, you also likely in the beginning said, yes, and you can't read it in the original, you, you need translations. Yes, there are many of us who will never be able to read it in the original. Our brains just don't work that way. So thank you, all our gratitude for uh, giving us this gift of being able to read and think about and understand uh, translation, motivations, the passion for different texts. Uh, it's just been a treat listening to all of you. Rana so wonderfully moderated and each of the three of you, I mean, it was just phenomenal. Um, I learned so much. I have so many more questions, uh, but I, of course we can't go on forever. We'll just have to um, save that for another session. Thank you very much from uh, Literature at Kalagoda. Thank you very much from the Bangalore International Center. Thank you to them for collaborating with this session. And um, see you all soon, I hope, perhaps physically, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I can say that in a few languages. <laughs> <laughs>